And for specifically today, I'm very pleased that we are able to attract all the way from Davenport, uh, Professor William Roba, who um, is a professor at Scott Community College. He took his master's degree in European history from Cornell University and his PhD in American studies at the University of Iowa. He began researching German Iowan history and literature in the early 1980s and has continued in this specialization with publication of three different books and numerous essays and articles. He currently serves as president of the Society for German American Studies and he joined the American Schleswig Holstein Heritage Society when it was first formed, which I believe was in the mid 80s. Um, and so, without further ado, I will turn the microphone, remembering to make it taller, uh, turn it over to Professor Bill Roba. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And it sounds like I should stay around for some of these events, which uh, sound like a lot of fun, but I may not be able to. Uh, I want to just for a moment thank the uh, staff and executive director here at the museum uh, for all sorts of help and assistance. This has been a very easy sort of thing for me to plan for, and uh, everybody I want to see here is showing up. Now, speaking a little bit louder or a little bit higher, you know. Yeah, that, I don't, I don't listen. Well, let's see how this works out. Is this perhaps a little better? Uh, can you hear? You have to project. <laughs> well, that's never a problem when I'm teaching in class, but it's uh, a little bit different. Um, the, uh, the part that I, I would like uh, to say, though, I've been sitting here. Of course, I haven't had my lunch yet, but everybody is eating what they want because they brought their own brown bag lunch. I think it's a great idea. It's much better when you show up and somebody has made a mistake and there's a hundred fried sardine sandwiches that have to be distributed. So this is a lot better way to uh, lunch at and learn at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the research that I've done over the years has uh, made me really wonder about uh, how this Schleswig-Holstein uh, concept developed, a historical uh, thing that I've been looking at for a number of years, and in particular, it's made me want to find out more about my grandmother's mother, uh, Otelia Andresen. I know some uh, facts about her, born in 1856 in North Schleswig, so, all right, she's quote unquote Danish, and she died in 1931 in Davenport. Uh, besides that, um, I have some very interesting sort of family heirlooms. Now, I've never seen them, but one of my cousins has this silver spoon and a silver spoon with a very interesting sort of inscription. Um, the gift and the giver are yours forever. Um, don't know very much about this. Uh, it's kind of an interesting part of the story. And what I thought I would do today is show you how sometimes you can place your family stories or what you know about them, even if you don't know everything that you want to know, how you can place it in a sort of a larger context and one that may help to explain some things about you and uh, your place in the world. Um, I know that Otelia came from the border frontier between the kingdom of Denmark and the new German Empire. She came to Iowa approximately 1870. And she was part of uh, the migration of 129,000 people from the two duchies of Schleswig and Holstein, 1871 to 1914. Um, in this uh, particular citation, the German and Scandinavian migration to America from the 19th and 20th century is the result of uh, a lot of research in 1981. The 1980s are kind of the, the beginning of a deeper, uh, more focused analysis of migration. Um, we know that a number of things about these two duchies, uh, they did have a very special relationship and the particularly important idea of being eternally undivided, at least after a um, uh, treaty was signed in 1460, uh, it worked for a couple hundred years rather easily. But as 
history changed in Europe, and we in fact have the, the influence of, of new ideas. Um, it changed obviously in the middle of the 19th century, redefined by nationalist and an unsuccessful attempt at independence for Schleswig and Holstein. Further changed another generation later with uh, Otto von Bismarck's nationalism and the 1864 so-called smart war between Denmark and Prussia. Um, those of you who have uh, seen the film or enjoy watching films, I can certainly recommend the 1987 film uh, Babette's Feast, uh, based on the Isaac Dennison short story. Uh, a wonderful movie. I just saw it a couple weeks ago, and I just remarked uh, to myself, you know, I, I should, I should publicize this. This is a good movie, and it's set right around the early 1870s. Well, in terms of uh, looking at uh, my time uh, this afternoon, there's a couple things I want to talk about. And the very first one is a kind of overall broad migration pattern. Because I, I think it's, it's very important uh, to realize that the migration of a particular ancestor or members of a family or members of a particular uh, region or area are not necessarily unique. There are broad patterns that really help to define or explain why they got to where they got to, in this case, why Shasta Goldsteiners got to Iowa. And in looking at this, I just went to a, a Google map, uh, a little balloon, which are always fun to look at. This is a map that has um, Greenland larger than North America, but uh, you'll notice it's uh, one that we're familiar with. And the pattern, of course, is how that people around that balloon area got over to the United States. And more importantly, a pattern of how millions of Europeans got to America. It's pretty much the same pattern. <clears throat> Going into a little more depth, particularly with the Yukon, Dublin Peninsula, you can see the two area, two duchies talking about Schleswig to the north, but uh, influence uh, is different. Northern and southern Schleswig and Holstein to the south. In, in looking at that, um, we have uh, about 18,000 square miles uh, in this, which looks giant, gigantic on this map, but just remember what it looks like on a Google uh, world map. And uh, we know that this compares with uh, about 200,000 square miles in this Germanic Confederation uh, just to the south. But our key area is in looking at particularly Holstein, which was part of this confederation, and Schleswig, which really was not. Yet they are eternally uh, joined together and united. And there, of course, are, are other influences of a, of a traditional sort in terms of uh, aristocratic control and influence and land ownership. These things began to change in the 19th century. And in looking at some of these different influences, there, there's several that I want to mention. This area in general had more international economic influences working upon it. We can briefly refer to Flensburg in the 18th century, center of the rum trade on a global sort of basis. <coughs> and then secondly, in the 19th century, again, that closeness on the southern border to Hamburg uh, was not so much in the traditional Hanseatic sense as Hamburg was beginning to grow and develop because of the forces of industrialization, which also impacted on these two duchies and the existence of uh, a major uh, university, uh, Christian Albrecht University in Kiel from the late 17th century. So there's a background influences that, in fact, uh, did come together. But like other areas in Europe, people moved together, and they moved actually in transplanted villages. Walter Kampfhofner has written about this, speaking about Westphalians, 
moving to Missouri. Uh, individuals move, but they move with other members of a village or town that they live with. It's not surprising sometimes in doing research, you see 14-year-old, 15-year-old individuals, but they were looked after by other families, complete families moving with that individual. And that gives us a kind of a different sense of how this, um, this whole process sort of worked. We know that the starting point for Schleswig Holsteiners is in fact coming from the beautiful village of Preetz. Uh, this is May of 1846 when a corps of about 40 uh, Holsteiners arrived in Davenport. And uh, historian Dr. Kirk Hagenau, uh, researching uh, this period, uh, examined the, the Preetzer uh, Logan Blot and found a number of articles including one from December 26, 1846, right around Christmas time, explaining how most of these uh, 40 individuals had very successfully acclimatized themselves to Iowa, to Davenport, to this new world that they were moving to. And one individual was mentioned, there, there are a number of school teachers, uh, Kai Asma Shute, booked passage on the Camilla, sailed from Hamburg, and he had successfully migrated to Davenport and Scott County. Now, beyond this particular village, which is part of a slightly larger area, this is the probe sty of about 51 square miles. 7,681 people lived here. Uh, they all didn't move, but many of them did in the following years. And what they were able to take advantage of were new forms of transportation. Um, technology began to sharpen and refine this process of migration. And probably the most interesting and overlooked internal connection in this area is to look at the development in 1844 of the uh, a a railroad connection from Altona, near Hamburg, to Kiel with a branch from Neumunster to Rendsburg. This was in 1844. A generation later, in 1866, this was turned into a major line, Hamburg, Neumunster, Kiel. I've still taken, I've been on this line myself, it still exists, but you can see some of the uh, towns and cities here being connected, and whether or not um, my grandmother's mother took this train, I doubt it, I'm quite sure my ancestors walked, but if you could take the train, the train redefined a north-south connection directly going to Hamburg. And Hamburg, um, there's a kind of a romantic painting from the 1840s, quickly became one of the major centers of transporting people from Northern Europe to America. Along with the other Hanseatic city of Bremen, individuals, entrepreneurs, capitalists, created their own businesses of getting people from Europe on trains to come to their city be put up in an immigrant hotel, uh, food, furnishing, everything, waiting for a ship to go to the New World. And this process began to accelerate with some additional technological changes. One that's really overlooked, but if you stop to think about it, it makes a lot of sense. It's the steam-driven screw propeller. Once you apply steam to ships, you accelerate transportation, you make it more efficient, and from an entrepreneur standpoint, you can make a lot more profits. Now, it's sort of hard to believe that this is the beginning of the end. The 1850s, of course, is a period of tremendous uh, uh, clipper ships, uh, full sail and everything. Uh, whenever I mention this to some of my students, I tell them they should go out and buy a bottle of Cuddy Sark, you know, just to look at the ship on the outside, nothing more. Put it, put it on the shelf and, and think about it. And in the very beginning, it's maybe something like 5% of 
of ships leaving Hamburg are steam driven. This accelerated in the 1850s. It cost money, capitalists, entrepreneurs were willing to reinvest in the business, and all of a sudden it changed the basis of moving people. Instead of um, waiting, sometimes uh, it's, it's been suggested that the length of time from Hamburg to New York was something like 43 to 63 days. Um, you need a wind, you can't have 40 miles an hour wind, you can't have a tornado, you can't have a storm. I mean, it's waiting around uh, to go to America. With the steam propelled uh, type of ship, this was whittled down to something like 12 to 14 days, two weeks. Well, all of a sudden, entrepreneurs are starting to think, well, I'm going to get two steamships and they're going to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're going to go on a regular basis, a regular schedule. That reduces the time. They're in an immigrant hotel. That means they can decide when they want to go. And this is from uh, late spring through middle of uh, fall was a, a normal uh, shipping season in this period of time. And it enhanced Hamburg and Bremen. It enhanced the power of these entrepreneurs and these capitalists. And it made sure that New York City was the major seaport they were going to. Um, this is a view of Castle Garden outside. There certainly were other seaports that were important in the 1850s. But with the coming of the American Civil War and Abraham Lincoln's blockade of seaports, New York remained the most uh, desirable port. It's cl the closest one to go to. And in this period of time, uh, immigrants were completely at the mercy of other capitalists and entrepreneurs, mind changing, uh, getting a hotel, hiring a hack cab. I don't know if that one guy has his hand in somebody else's pocket, but if you bought your ticket in Europe, a ticket that would take you all the way beyond New York to the West, to by the 1850s, the build, building of railroad connections with Chicago made this the, the future process of going primarily in that Western direction to Chicago and on to what were the emerging German American cities of Milwaukee. Davenport and St. Louis. With this process in mind, one that fits any number of ethnic groups um, uh, in this period of time, there's something else that I want to uh, focus on today, a second sort of topical area, taking a look at the leadership. And I think it's in this regard we're going to begin to see how there could be an influential ethnic identity of just the coast standards. Um, uh, two duchies from a relatively small area. Uh, we have the population numbers, and we're looking at millions of immigrants coming over. Um, there's hundreds of thousands coming to the Midwest. How did this work out? And I think one of the key ingredients, besides having that very nice uh, train connection going north and south in the duchies, that leadership is one thing to look at, and in particular, in the mid-1850s, mid-19th century, we have that group of individuals who have been, become very dedicated to reform and change. They had an agenda, more or less, of wanting more personal freedom and liberty with wider political participation and freedom from official uh, religious requirements. This group, commonly called 1848ers, of course, are throughout all of Europe. A large number are in German-speaking parts of Europe. But it's the 48ers who were part of Schleswig-Holstein, the failed 1848-49 uh, war, uh, and then the eventual 1864-1866 major war. Those individuals had a way of looking, they had a vision that was very important, and I've chosen three significant ones who lived in Davenport. I might mention all three were lawyers, uh, that's apparently the love for success then and now, and briefly talk about them. 
um, and give you some idea of how this might account for embedding a concept that is still with us today. The first individual is Theodor Olshausen, um, one of a family of three sons. One was a theologian, another was a doctor. He was a very gifted writer and a journalist. And um, it, as it turns out, in the provisional Schleswig-Holstein government, he was the only member who was a supporter of the Socialist Party. He had a radical view of that vision, uh, one that he poured uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm in editing newspapers, uh, writing articles. Um, he moved to Davenport and helped start uh, an important newspaper, Der Democrat, while in Davenport. He was able to use the steamboat to get down to St. Louis, where he became uh, involved in journalism there and helped launch um, the Vestica Post, eventually purchased by Pulitzer, and uh, eventually creating uh, very important <coughs> national newspapers. He wrote a two-volume, uncompleted description of America, which in and of itself was extremely uh, important in creating a sort of image of what this new country was like. The second individual uh, is Hans Reimer Clausen, um, very, very important individual. And this book, in fact, uh, back in 1994, was the beginning of a series of um, uh, biographies and an emphasis upon creating a historical understanding of individuals. And my thought today is that it may, in fact, uh, be time to um, present this in a, in a broader uh, kind of context. Hans Reimer Clausen immediately became the most uh, influential lawyer in Scott County, uh, providing services for the new German-speaking immigrants. He also uh, became uh, active in founding the Republican Party and was an influential politician uh, down through the 1890s. Throughout that period of time, he particularly worked along the lines of uh, being against prohibition and being against the strict Sabbath laws, Sabbatarian laws of the state of Iowa. The third individual from Schleswig-Holstein, Frederick Hetty, is, uh, is less well known than the other two, uh, but he was very active in newspapers after becoming a lawyer, worked with Olshausen. He co-founded uh, in Kiel uh, a Turner Society, very popular in uh, the German cities in that period of time. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that when we see this, the same idea uh, being applied in Iowa. But with Hetty, we have someone who actually fought in the Schleswig-Holstein War. Um, with, and with Hetty, we have someone with very, very useful organizational skills. And coming to Davenport, uh, Hetty uh, helped to uh, organize a uh, local uh, Turner Society. He was able to um, plan and provided much of the leadership in 1857 for an intentional uh, community building effort in Grand Island, which as you know, turned out to be very successful. So with these three individuals, uh, I think we have a, an interesting core group. There's many others, but uh, enough of um, leadership and enough of a vision to figure out a way to be influential in developing Iowa along the lines of an 1848 perspective, along the lines of a Schleswig-Holstein set of values. And we find um, Iowa in 1850 to be very, very con congenial uh, for, to these individuals. And what I think they developed was uh, a great interest in using their linguistic skills, in a sense, because they spoke a version uh, of a language called Low German, Pladuch. 
uh, not the official German that we are familiar with, something that uh, people in Schleswig would understand. And as it turns out, um, their uh, numbers are not enough by themselves, but what I think happened is that they were very successful in providing the thinking and the leadership to other provinces of North Germany. We find in terms of this uh, Pomeranians, Mecklenburgers, Hanoverians, Ostfriesian settlements in Iowa, different geographical areas, and they were influenced by the thinking of these three and other 1848er Schleswig-Holstein leaders. <coughs> this development is what I'm, I'm calling this German Iowans, not German Americans, but German Iowans. And the earliest development was creating a newspaper, later called Iowa's Low German Bible. Uh, it was in German, but it was written in a way that had the style of, uh, of Low German uh, thinking. It provided uh, a number of things, primarily providing information for immigrants, uh, coordinating information, and influencing public opinion, commenting on state and national politics from a perspective of 1848ers and from the values of Schleswig Holsteiners who had lost their war in Europe, but maybe could implement their vision in Iowa. And that's the early thinking uh, behind this. The, um, the creation with this newspaper was a kind of cultural identity in which Germans migrating to Iowa, I'm saying became eventually influenced as German Iowans, perceived their place in Iowa as central in the emerging society. Not on the margins, not as a, a subculture, not as anything else, but actually in the driver's seat. Um, and this was, a, of course, a very exciting idea for the leaders and for those individuals who, were, who read the newspaper. Now, secondly, in 1856, the building of the Rock Island Railroad Bridge to Davenport connected Davenport directly with Chicago as a hub of um, railroads. And although it's very true, of course, Dubuque is a corridor, and uh, Clinton is the gateway to the west, and Burlington, all of this is true, but it's Davenport that had the first actual connection, and even though these other cities were very successful in building their population, in settling areas to the west of it, this initial connection with Davenport ensured that its ideas would be disseminated throughout the state of Iowa. Remember, about one half of Iowa is still frontier in 1850. Uh, it's unsettled by European American settlers. Along with this, there is a third development in creating uh, in Davenport a major uh, organization called the Turners, um, essentially combining the idea of uh, physical health with mental health. Uh, sponsoring gymnastics, uh, all sorts of uh, athletic contests, uh, and at the same time, uh, putting on a winter lecture series, uh, supporting music groups that were starting, and by 1886, building this giant downtown Davenport building, this is the Turner Grand Opera on the right, it's a little hard to see, but if you're looking at not nothing else, it's a castle on Main Street protection, security for the generations getting older and moving on. This seemed to be the bulwark in the future that their ideas could be continued. We know that um, this needed one more part to it and it included the interesting way of thinking about the American Civil War. In April, Lincoln called for 60,000 volunteers they signed up for 90, month, 90 days, three months. And the Iowa First Volunteers was one of the groups involved with this, including Hans Reimer Clausen's son, who joined up, but he was a veteran of the uh, 
because the coastline war, so he knew what he was doing, and their return in the fall of 1861 began the planning for something we know as the Grand Army of the Republic. Veterans of the federal side in the Civil War, this is a new admixture to that first generation. This is a new generation that actually fought and died for these ideas, adding on union, union forever, adding on the, the destruction of slavery to the 1848 ideas. It's a very logical extension. And this meant, or at least another generation of continuity throughout the state, uh, at least in terms of many of these values and ideas. And I think it's, um, it's interesting that by this period of time, let's say by the 1870s or 1880s, there was very definitely a view of how Schleswig Holsteiners could provide a sort of way of mediating on the one hand between English-speaking Americans and on the other, uh, German-speaking immigrants. It's, um, it's an interesting kind of situation, sort of an alternative Germanness in Iowa, but we know that it was a basis for uniting leadership with political influence and social acceptance. Looking at it this way, if you were a, a Danish immigrant family coming to the Midwest, coming to Iowa, you could choose. You could uh, become American as quickly as you could. Uh, of course, at the same time, uh, you could assimilate and end up becoming a German, uh, a place of close time German. That's different. So anti-German ideas could be slowly eroded, could be controlled in a certain way, which, which added uh, a very interesting part to this concept, that one which uh, at least still shows up in the middle of the 20th century. Now, there's two other aspects to this that I want to mention briefly. I think one uh, you've let know already, but starting in the 1850s and following through for at least the next generation, we have a number of very interesting attempts at community building, some which were successful, and some very well-known Swiss the Holstein settlements. Of course, in this area, um, Holstein, Schleswig, uh, Grand Island, Omaha, these are areas which had uh, a very solid schleswig holstein contingent, low German newspapers, and many of these same ideas, which can be traced back uh, to Davenport. I also want to include uh, Rhinebeck, um, I spelled on the map, I'm sorry, uh, as another area with early schleswig holstein planning and, and success in developing uh, a, a settlement a community. Along with this, though, there are some other kinds of uh, towns, and um, there's sort of a counterexample. Not, not every small town is a schleswig holstein uh, as we know. And a good example, a quick example for me at least, is thinking of Dyersville uh, to the west of Dubuque. Um, and this was founded in 1836 because of a tributary of the Macogan River. Um, fast enough river, an early mill, a place for farmers to ground their corn. It worked in terms of that. And in one of the uh, early um, uh, censuses, um, we find uh, there's uh, Germans from Oldenburg, Hanover, Westphalia, none from Schleswig Holstein. Is there still German heritage or memory of this? Yes. It's not actual Schleswig Holsteiners starting this community, but it fits into that idea or pattern of the state being influenced indirectly from ideas in Davenport and from that particular core area. I included New Holstein up in Wisconsin because it was started about the same time as Davenport, had a great deal of interest in writing about it, but it's a uh, community that uh, might have had some utopian ideas but ran into some problems. And uh, the very first census in 1850 showed uh, only 275 German residents out of a population of 
1,743. Swampy land, uh, large forests, which were made it difficult in terms of uh, farming, and being located about halfway between Green Bay and Milwaukee, uh, cities that offered many more opportunities for uh, potential uh, German-speaking immigrants. The, um, the quick look at some of these um, land communities which did succeed, I mentioned New Ulm in Wisconsin, and Grand Island and itself had some of those initial ideas, but um, with Frederick Heavy's leadership and luckily several railroads deciding to make it a major shipping point, Grand Island succeeded and grew and expanded from, from that, that early beginning. Uh, current population of about 50,000 people. The railroad expansion also led to other forms of community building, and the one that I, I just ran across in preparing this, I don't know very much about Indian Grove, Missouri, except that the uh, original founders were seven schleswig holstein families from Clinton County. So this is probably an element of uh, a lot of land, uh, adequate railroad connections to it, and um, started a small town, which the um, uh, latest population count is just under 5,000. Now, another thing that we know about in, in Iowa, I should mention, of course, is how there sometimes are coordinated towns of ethnic affinity. I was just thinking about it. Uh, you know, Marnie's not too far away with Schleswig Holsteiners, uh, lots of good Danish descended people here in Elkhorn, but there, there's an affinity uh, between the communities. There's, of course, some other interesting geography. I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, Iowa's uh, double county. Sooth County is twice the size. Well, there's all sorts of little ethnic towns and villages. Um, in my own family, um, they grew up, uh, lived for a while in Spea City, 10 miles from the border with a uh, Swedish small town. And of course, about 10 miles away, they had the uh, uh, blooming town of Germania, uh, now called Lakota, which sort of, I guess people felt comfortable, the Germans could watch out what the Swedes were doing, uh, only about 10 miles away. Uh, and there's Ringstead, uh, not too far away, and Esterville, and so that's a, and that is a county from, that was settled around 1890. You can find this, community start with uh, an ethnic group, uh, families that know one another, but they're sometimes not too far away from other ethnic groups. Now the last uh, example of, of this thing called Schleswig-Holstein or German Iowa Post that I want to mention is something I just um, hit upon a few months ago. Um, I had thought it existed, but I actually got some information on it. And that is the emergence in Scott County of uh, Danish Lutheranism in the late 19th century. And in looking at it, um, the original 1848er, Schleswig Holstein point of view was against Danish in the schools and the churches that was that two nationalism sort of conflicting with each other. I found it very interesting three generations later, or at least by the period of the late 1870s to find uh, in Davenport um, uh, Danish migration and enough to request a church service uh, by one of the German Lutheran pastors who apparently was very linguistically gifted. Uh, this started in 1878 and continued on until 1903 when there were enough members, um, enough Danish Lutheran individuals to start their own church, which continued until 1916, and eventually switched over to English and lasted at least about another 10 years. So I find this to be an interesting example of how this um, uh, face the coastline approach could start with very high ideals, very extreme points of view, could continue and flourish in the new world, and eventually towards the end of its uh, period of strong influence actually uh, makes some changes or modifications. 
Um, I um, hope this has been useful in several ways to talk about not just individuals, uh, not just names and dates, and I had to be a little bit limited here, but looking at the overall migration pattern, looking at the importance of leadership, and then looking at least uh, at some institutional ways of supporting this uh, German island uh, approach to things, eventually even with founding other towns, a sort of uh, new colonies in the state of Iowa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. And we do have time for some questions. We've got maybe about 10 minutes to spend it. And there's an immediate hand over here. Yes. The question is, when the immigrants left from Hamburg, did they always come to New York or their other ports no, of entry? And, and you, you can uh, look at the pattern of the uh, 19th century. Galveston, Texas uh, was a port. New Orleans uh, was a popular port. Some writers have suggested that were named the, the uh, preferred way of getting up the Mississippi River to go to New Orleans. But Baltimore was also a very active port in this period of time. These are all seaports that were closed down during the American Civil War. It's New York that actually spent money to kind of improve their harbor because Philadelphia uh, also, uh, also had migrants coming to it. There were, there were many other smaller areas, but it's the process of industrialization can be applied to looking at choosing one seaport and improving it and making that the targeted place to go. It, and nobody decided this, it just sort of happened. I mean, they got more and more immigration, it spent more money to improve the situation, but it was, uh, this thing in Castle Garden was just wide open. Uh, anything goes. The thing I, I always keep in mind, there's only one requirement to get into America, you had to be alive. If you were dead, if they kicked you off the boat, uh, you, you don't show up on Other questions? No pressure. This um, is just a question. Uh, in the photo where I was on, there was a Danish Lutheran church and a German Lutheran church. I think into the 50s, yeah, 18, 1950. Yes, in the town, did you say Volga? Uh, Avoca. Avoca, oh, sure. Yeah, uh, in Avoca, there was both a Danish Lutheran church and a German Lutheran church into the 50s. And part of that would have been from different, the way that the national synods developed, first among ethnic lines, and then only in the 50s and 60s and some of those ethnic synods start to officially merge. She did then merge. Yeah. yeah. John Mark saying 1962? 1960 and 62. 60 and 62 critical years of, of merger within the Transvestite National, or Scandinavian and Germanic uh, Lutheran church bodies. Yeah, I just close by saying I, I think it's uh, so interesting to come across this new development and needs to do research along the way. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Please uh, visit Fill out your evaluation forms, and we'll hope to see you next next month for our next program. Or it's not not often, it's Saturday night.